All right, well, I think we're going to get started. Thank you so much to the Morgan Hill Chamber of Commerce for this incredible uh, Women's Week that they put on and for inviting us to present a wonderful speaker. Um, thank you for, for being here for Unconscious Culpability, Examining the Womanist-Feminist Intersection of Political Identity and Social Responsibility. Um, we are having the wonderful speaker, Raina Munson, who is a Morgan Hill business owner of The Secret Door, which is downtown. Uh, a reimagined wellness space solely dedicated to assisting clients to align mind, body, and spirit in more pragmatic and real world accessible ways for those not traditionally centered in spiritual practices. She's a holistic life coach, certified clinical hypnotherapist, uh, master Yusui Reiki practitioner, former tech professional, wife, mother, and activist. She's spoken on topics of racial justice at several NAACP rallies and many other forums. And um, I'm your host, I guess you could say, Jordan Rosenfeld, local writer, uh, member of Surge South County. And I'm gonna take it away, hand it over to Raina. Oh, I should just mention, we are going to be, Raina is uh, gonna speak some, and then we're gonna really open it up for Q&A. We'd love for you to ask um, any of the questions that are on your mind. Um, and we would like this to be someone, to feel like we're kind of in a, a room together hanging out, not you know like she's at the podium. I know that's important. So. Um, Raina, thank you so much for being here today. And um, how are you doing? Let's start there, and then I'd like for you to to get started. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, first, thank you so much for that lovely welcome and introduction, Jordan. I appreciate you and the group with Surge inviting me to be a part of this beautiful Women's Week event. Um, I'm excited and proud to be speaking on the actual centennial of the women's right to vote, 19th Amendment ratified. Um, it's an auspicious day. Uh, I am a little bit, I, I don't wanna be subdued, I am very excited, but you know, in light of the events that have been unfolding over the last few days and my activism work, I have to say I, I've been um, quite busy just you know, coordinating with other groups and other other speakers and other activists to figure out what do we do next? What are our next steps? Um, how can we be of service? How can we um, coalesce and create a more cohesive and and uh, united uh, ask of all of us to to just take a moment and take a step back from our connection to property and stuff and really just connect with each other on a human level. I want to make sure that um, everyone knows that the things that are happening right now are happening for a reason. You know, that we have what is a veritable perfect storm literally happening. We've got things that have never happened before. Two hurricanes set to make landfall at the same time. Um, seismic shifts, volcanic eruptions, you know, legendary fires across the globe. I mean, the entirety of Australia was burning for months. And just there's a lot of energy that's released in these times. Um, we have a lot of cataclysmic energetic shift here in the United States between the racial tensions and the political infighting and, you know, just a myriad of things. But I want this moment here with all of us connected to be a safe space, to be a soft place to land, a place to share, a place to be open, a place to be vulnerable, and to understand that we're all here for one thing. I'm here to heal. Um, I'm here to create room and hold space for all of us to heal. And it's time. It's time for us to heal. And in that spirit, I wanted to come to this and talk to some of the things that happened to get us to this point. I think um, when we're talking about the women's suffrage movement, it dates back before the Civil War it was starting to gain steam. And at that time, it was very much um, in connection and paralleled and connected to the greater abolitionist and uh, emancipation movement. And so you had these giants of oratory, these amazing founding mothers and fathers who came to agreement that not just all men, but all people were created equal and that we should all share in, in the unalienable right to 
life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in order for us to create this perfect union, we had to be unified. And that meant all of us, women, men, people of color, Caucasians, everyone. And so they began this momentous fight. And it took almost 100 years for women to gain the right to vote. And even through that time, which I'm sure at the time to the women involved was un unspeakable and unheard of, Black men gained the right to vote before they did, which was like a double slap in the face at, you know, at that point, because the suffragist movement was mostly peopled by the daughters of educated women and landed women and women of means and influence. And that's how the movement started. It was whispered in parlors and at, you know, different women's events where they were quilting and, and doing things that seem non-threatening. And as soon as all of the men would retire to the library for their aperitif, they would start to, you know, plot. <laughs> so you get this kind of dualistic underground, this underground of women who came together. I mean, fantastic, really, really audacious women, you know, Harriet Katie Eaton and Lucretia Mott and Susan B. Anthony. And then you get these amazing, amazing um, women of color, Sojourner Truth and uh, Mary Church and all of these people. And, you know, you get the abolitionist and you get the, the men coming in, Frederick Douglass orating and speaking to the fact that all people deserve to have an equal share in the ability to prosper. And so we, they created a, a groundswell of support and they pushed through. And I think that's what we're being called to do now is to come together because there's strength in numbers. I'm a big sports person. I was an athlete, so I'll, I'll make a lot of sports analogies and references, but it is a true, it's a truism. There is strength in numbers. When people of like mind and like cause come together with a concerted effort and a focused intention, things can shift, things can change and, and movement happens. And so these amazing, brave, bold, pioneering women pushed through. And in 1920, they got the right to vote. And it was fantastic. However, as part and parcel of them receiving the right to vote, there was a rift in that movement of women because women of color were left behind. While they were ceded the legal right to vote, there were so many barriers and obstacles to the actualization of that vote that they really didn't, in essence, receive the right to vote. So there became this resentment because they felt as though we put this in our um, forefront and carried it on our backs and were broken with a lash and beaten and, and you know, really bearing the brunt of the vicious and violent um, retribution of people who felt like women did not and could not be trusted with the vote. So there was this rift that occurred then and that has by, by twos and fews and over time just widen until we get to a place where women of color and white women are often pitted against each other when we should have common cause because we have the same concerns. We want universal health care. We want infrastructural change for child care. We want the ability to make the same amount of money for the same work. So we want very like things. However, because there's so many little small divisions, cracks in our armor, chinks in our phalanx that have been created by external forces, as with any movement. Anyone trying to break a movement, whether it's unionization, civil rights, women's suffrage, knows that in order to get in, you need to infiltrate and you need to divide. You need to speak to people's egos. And when you're talking about people who have grandiose ideas and big dreams, ego is going to play a huge part. So if you can get in their mind, get in their head and tell them, you don't need them, you can get this done without them. And you can do it in a way that's gonna be manifested for your betterment and it doesn't matter who else is going to be there then you can create that wedge that continues to widen and now we've gotten to a space where 
you have, uh, you know, these tropes that they trot out when they're speaking of women, the angry black woman, the Karen, all of these monikers that they place upon us to divide us and keep us apart. They throw these numbers out. 53% of white women voted against women's rights and women's ideology. Well, no, that's not true. They voted their political ideology. And we have to be able to separate these things and not make them personal betrayals. We can't look at each other and have distrust. We can't hold each other at arm's length because this this area between us, this unspoken vow that's been broken, continues to wound us. So my major and overarching um, mission always is to heal. Um, in my work, with my clients, in coaching, in doing energy work, it's always at the core about healing, healing the self and then also healing others. Because through healing, we begin to see that nothing is insurmountable. When you're a healed heart, a healed mind, a healed spirit, you begin to understand that there's miracles. Everyday living is miraculous. And we have made such strides. And this is still and has the opportunity to still be that shining beacon on a hill. And we can realize those ideals that were put forth in our formation. When this nation was founded, even though the things that were written were not meant to encompass women or people of color, the truth is prevalent. When the truth is in the midst, whatever else other, you know, uh, adjoining things that are there, they cannot remove that kernel. The truth will set you free. The truth can never be hidden. And the truth is, is, is a, a healing moment for us all. And I believe that the truth is, when we move out of ego, move out of self, and look at the world from a humanistic voice, a humanistic place with the intention to create a, a, better, a better society for all humanity, then we're our best selves. And we really realize change and we see things happen that, you know, heretofore were never imagined could be possible. So with that energy, I wanted to come to this talk and, and just speak to um, the intersectionality that we now find ourselves at, where we can create the world we want to live in, where we can have women and men and people of color and LGBTQ and everyone coalesced into the whole, where no one is left behind, where no one falls through the cracks, where no one is othered. When we are in those spaces, and I'm sure we've all been there, whether it's with your family, with your friend groups, when you're in your church, when you're in a space where everyone there is of same mind and same intention and focused on a goal, it's transcendent. You can feel it. It is uplifting, it's enlivening, it's energetic, it's beautiful, and I want us to dwell in that space always, and we can. It's very possible. Myself personally, I, you know, I endure the slings and arrows that we all do. We all get knocked down, and you begin just to take a little moment for a personal anecdote to create these um, archetypes, and we begin to feed these, these caricatures in our mind, and we begin to say, all X person, all people of this sort behave in this way. And for me, that started in grade school. Again, like I said, I love basketball. I always have. I was a very tall, spindly, ungainly child, but I love to play basketball. Unfortunately, when you are in elementary school, there are no organized sports that are girls leagues and boys leagues or even co-ed. It's just whoever's got the most people and whoever gets to the, you know, the, the playground first rules. And the boys had a great system. They knew how to I need to use the restroom right before the bell ring and they get out there and they get their games going and it was pickup and you had to be good and you, you, you had to get in there and we watched them play for months. And I think this was maybe fourth grade. And finally I was like, we need to just, you know, I just learned about something we can do. We need to sign a petition that says, you've got to let us play. We've got a right to play. The playground is free for everyone. Everyone should get to play. Well, as you can imagine, boys in the fourth grade are not greatly moved by a petition on college rule paper from a bunch of fourth grade girls. So the petition kind of fizzled out and didn't go anywhere. And 
as most teachers do, I've got enough on my plate. You guys figure it out. This is something you guys can work out to your own benefit so that everyone is, co is content and or no more basketball. So at that point, it's like, well, I got to be careful because if I make too much noise, then no one gets to play. So I had to go back into my bag of tricks and I came up with a new plan. Well, let's just challenge them. Let's go out and let's challenge them to a game and we'll just see if we can play and we can show them that we're good, they'll let us play. They can't deny us. So I march out there with my girl squad and I walk right onto the boys game and disrupt. And unbeknownst to me, the girls decided, well, I don't know that I want to walk right into the middle of the game. So when I look back, it was just me. And the boy said, okay, fine. You got to play Sammy. Well, Sammy's one of these fourth graders that looks like an adult. <laughs> so now it's me trying to, with all of my 70 pounds, to outsmart, out, you know, outplay, outwit this huge kid. And because he's laughing and falling all over himself at the thought that this little nerdy girl in glasses is going to actually try to play him, I score on him not once, but twice. And now it's the whoa moment where everyone's like, okay. And in that moment, the boy said, fine, you can play. Now I had a choice at that moment to say, no, we all need to play. But because I was angry and resentful that they didn't have my back, I played with the boys. And so day after day, my friends would sit on the sideline and watch me play with the boys. And this is the movement of divide and conquer. And this is when I learned how to break a movement, how that all of the energy that we came out there with all the enthusiasm and those were my good friends. But in that moment, when they let me down, I in turn let them down when it would have been very easy for me to say, OK, come on, you guys, let's play. And so I learned you know, through the disappointment of my friends and not being able to play, that that's not the way to move forward. And so it kind of struck a chord in me that when I speak for someone, I speak for everyone. There's no just, oh, if I get to do it, it's good enough. And I think that's the same energy we need to come to as women. I think uh, come to any event or any um, obstacle as women. When I speak for myself, I speak for all of us. When I speak for my children, I speak for all of our children. When I speak for my husband, I speak for all of our husbands because we're one. We are the human family. It's not black and white. It's not male and female. It's just human. And so that being said, um, you know, we come now to another crossroads. We are at a very defining moment in our history. And I think we'll all look back on 2020 with its convergence of a great pandemic and economic, you know, collapse and political unrest and racial tension and, you know, cataclysmic, um, you know, fires and, and, and all of these uh, different weather events and say, how did we survive? but we will survive because we're together. And again, there's strength in numbers. We are better together and we're resilient and we are extremely powerful. This is a defining moment, not just for people, but for women specifically. It's time for us to reclaim our divine feminine energy, our goddess power, our ability to discern, our beautiful and keen intuition, all of the things that make us different not less than, just different than everyone else. And we need to harness those energies for the betterment of us all. And with that, I would like to kind of open this up a little bit so that we can take some questions. Um, again, I had a little bit more of a somber and, and prepared commentary, but I think what I'd like to really do is make this about all of us and not just about someone speaking to you or you know finger wagging from up high. I'd love for us to have a real exchange because I can't see all of you, but I'm feeding from the energy. And I think that there's a lot of you that have something to say. And if it's something that's uncomfortable, I invite you to, to be uncomfortable with me. I invite you to feel safe. I invite you to be open and ask the hard questions. 
Sometimes you have to have a difficult conversation because you can't heal it unless you feel it. And a lot of times we compartmentalize and we put things that are unpleasant or difficult to deal with away. And it's time to stop doing that. We've got to move beyond that. So if anyone has anything they'd like to add, I'd be happy to. How they can. So if you hit, there's a raise your hand function under your, your face and, um, you it, it'll let me know and, and then i can let you talk um before i do that i did want to i wanted to ask you myself a question um sure i really like what you have to say about healing and i know you we've talked in prior conversations about um really you come from a really loving perspective and i think that is wonderful i don't know that everybody comes from that perspective and i know a lot what i hear a lot of people asking as the justice is um, what can I do? How can I, what actions, what concrete actions could I take today to make the world a better place for my uh, fellow women of color? For, you know, if I'm a white woman, what can I actually do you know, that is significant or that is it within my purview? You know? So I'll just open that one up to you. I think the first thing you can do is just come to a conversation ready to listen to hear one another. I think there is so much um, cathartic energy in unburdening yourself of trauma, of pain. And even though it's uncomfortable and it definitely can make for a, a difficult conversation, just listening and hearing someone without the defense mechanism, without that moment that says, but yeah, I understand, but you want to just take that moment to receive what they're saying. So I think that the first thing you have to do in any um, uh, any conversation, any attempt to, to heal a rift is just to hear one another. And then um, you're going to take that hearing and you're going to empathize. And then you're going to acknowledge. And then you're going to let it go. And I think if we do those things in that order, we get to a place where we are unburdened and we're also seen, felt, and heard, and no one has to re now then pick the burden up. And I think that becomes the, 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 uh, the thing that's unattractive when you hear someone speaking or saying something that you don't agree with because you feel like, well, if they're saying that, then that means that now I've got to hold that. And you don't. It's very, very easy to say, I hear you. I empathize with you. Now, that just says, I understand from your perspective how that could feel. It doesn't mean it's my perspective, but I can empathize with you. Empathy is a huge, huge thing that we need to really, really work on. And then acknowledging it. I acknowledge your hurt, whether it was intentional on my part or not. And then after you do those things, then you can let it go. It doesn't become now your burden to carry. It just becomes something that you've moved through. And those words, heal, H-E-A-L, hear, empathize, acknowledge, and let go. Those, uh, obviously, let go is two words, but it's much better when you, <laughs> you put it on there. But, you know, we want to get to a place where we can do it by rote, where it's automatic, where someone says something to me that I don't necessarily agree with, but it doesn't get my back up. It doesn't make me just listen to defend. It doesn't make me shut off my reception mode. I can't receive what you're saying because you've touched me in a way that makes me feel indicted. And I think so many conversations die on the vine because of that. So as a white, and then the other thing is, I want us to get away from as an ally, as a white woman, what can, no, we're humans. As a human, how can I be better? All of us, not just white women, not just black women, all women. How can we all be better? Because I'm not angry and you're not dialing the police. So we can all acknowledge that there've been some things that have been cast upon us that may not even fit. But because we see it so prevalently, we come to every conversation with that burden. And it's not even yours. So as a white woman, 
what you can do is just be a person. Just be a person. If I were in that, in that person's predicament, how would I feel? I've heard what you said has happened to you. How would that make me feel? That's the empathy. Ah, I acknowledge that that's difficult. And I don't have that experience, but I can acknowledge that that would be something difficult to deal with. And now that we've heard each other out, we've empathized with each other's position, we've you know, acknowledged that we receive each other, we can let this go so that we can create a foundation for a productive way forward. Now we get to the space, once you heal, now you have a mission. How do we move forward? But we can't move forward until we address that part. And we, a lot of times people want us to go, well, that's in the past. We got to stop going back. We can't talk about that. And I feel like it's not just about women. It's not just about, uh, you know, racial tension. It's about everything. This is what happens in families. People have, you know, have some trauma or wound that has been inflicted upon them and they can't even speak it out loud because the family is going to feel indicted. Oh, well, why are you bringing that up now? Because it's still hurting me right now. Because everything that's happening is happening all the time. Whether it happened to you when you're four years old or when you're 40 years old. Things that happen in your experience become a part of your life. They are part and parcel of the whole. So until we feel it, we can't heal it. And until we heal it, we can't move past it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as a again, as a white woman, I just want you to come to every experience and say, how would I feel if that was my sister, brother, husband, son, daughter? How would I feel if that were me? You know, and I've had that conversation with a very dear friend. We were having that conversation when Sandra Bland was murdered. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, oh my God, do you know how many times I've been pulled over? Because she's a speed demon. I've been pulled over by a cop and I was frustrated because I'm speeding because I've got somewhere to be. And I'm like, just give me my ticket so I can go. She's like, I cannot imagine that exchange turning into him dragging me from my car, slamming me to the ground, arresting me, and then the next day my family being called to tell them I'm dead. So if you can sit in that space, knowing that you weren't the perpetrator, but just sit in that space, what if that were me? The same way I can sit into the space of a friend of mine who said, oh, I don't vote. What? I'm stunned. You don't vote. What do you mean you don't vote? I voted religiously every chance I could get since I'm 18. But we have two different experiences. She's an upper middle class white woman of a certain age. And she's like, I don't need to. It doesn't, it's not part of my life. It doesn't affect me. And I was actually made silent. And I'm there very rarely without words. But I had to sit and say, what would that feel like? What would it feel like to not believe that your life, livelihood, safety, and way forward hang in the balance every time you cast your ballot? Because you've been so protected, so, so inculcated and inoculated, so woven into the fabric of the nation that your position is unassailable. That is something I can't even imagine. And we had the most profound conversation thereafter because we both saw something in each other. And she's like, because we were having the debate, she's like, I don't even know why you're a Democrat. That doesn't make sense. You're a business owner. Your husband's got a ton of money. You live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. You have two children in college. What are you voting for taxes for? And I'm like, I'm not voting for myself. I'm voting for the greater good. I'm voting for the safety net. I'm voting for the least amongst us because I'm extremely blessed. But for God, there go I. So I can never walk into the booth with only my own future to vote against or for. And so I want us all to just get out of that, that marginalization because that marginalizes you. Oh, well, I'm a white woman. No, you're a person. You have eyes. 
You know, you have your gut. Your gut is the second brain in your body. Something makes you feel sick in the pit of your stomach. It's not because it's happening to you. It's because you have empathy and you see something that's not right. And when I see something that's not right, I get involved. Whether it's two children fighting on the playground or it's in the voting booth or standing in front of 7,000 people at San Jose City Hall screaming, you know, not one more. It's all part of the whole. And we all have our part to play. Not everyone is going to do that. I don't expect everyone to march up and down the street with a, you know, a placard. But I do expect if you're at, you know, Sunday dinner and someone is saying something off color that you're going to go, we don't do that here. And it doesn't have to become an argument. Just be completely pragmatic about it. Just shut it down because you have sovereignty. You have that agency. And if you use your voice in whatever way you can, that's what you can do. No one can tell you what's expected of you or what you should be doing or how you should feel. Only you know. Great. Well, we do have um, a couple, well, we have a question in the chat and I was actually gonna give, um, Nikki had had her hand up and then put it down. Nikki, I'm gonna um, just quickly um, give you the opportunity to talk and if you don't have that question anymore, Oh, is she even with us anymore? I think she left us. Okay. So forget She's that one time. She's at the top. Oh, okay. There she goes. Hi, there you are. All right. Nikki, would you? Sorry, I'm, I'm a little slow at things here. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to go ahead and ask a question? And then we've got one from Kay Aurora. Thanks. Um, thank you, Raina. I, that was really that was very healing thank you i i came tonight really on the verge of tears i the events mm. in kenosha just have really you know this isn't all about me but they have definitely put me over the edge yeah. and so my original question was about the ally discussion but you and i have had a little bit of that before and what you said tonight was exactly what uh, was very helpful for me in understanding that. Mm -hmm. So I do have this thing though, that as a person of great privilege, mm -hmm. I do feel, and I, you know, I think some of this is how I was raised, that I have an extra responsibility because of my great privilege, the fact that I can move through life with relative ease, that I should do extra because I can. And so if you could speak to that, um, I would really appreciate it. I agree. Uh, my grandmother taught me to who much is given, much is expected. So just to speak to that, in proportion to your influence and privilege, then yes, whatever you feel comfortable doing, is what you should do. And it's not predicated on you being white. It's predicated on your ability to do what you have the ability to do because having the ability to affect change and then not utilizing it is, is that is the flip. That is the failure. That is the flaw. I think that um, specific to every group, you know, some people say, well, you know, you, you're very, I, I'm very fluid. I'm very amorphous. I can go, well, I make this joke all the time. I can go from a dice game to the White House and I've been to both. Um, I think that it doesn't have anything to do because clearly I don't present as someone who belongs in the White House or the Kremlin and I've been to both and the Great Wall of China and a lot of other places. But I think if you make it your mission to be part of the human family, nowhere feels alien to you. If you make it your business to do better for everyone, nothing feels outside of your reach. If you have great wealth, then you can do things that create change through financial means. If you have a wonderful writing ability, then you can use your pen. The pen is mightier than the sword. If you have a great speaking voice and you know how to reach people, if you're a wonderful, what we used to call a prayer warrior, if you're uh, you know, devoutly uh, involved in your church community and you've got a voice that people listen to and respect, we've got to wield the weapons that we were granted. We've got to use the gifts that we've received. And then when you identify those things, 
you utilize them the best way you know how. And I think, again, we did have that conversation about allies. And I don't want to denigrate that. What I say when people say, you know, I want to be a good ally. I want, I tell them saying I'm an ally creates a division because then you're not part of the whole. You're othering yourself by not saying we have a problem. I am involved in the we, not you have a problem. How can I help? Now, I know that's semantics, but it means a lot because when you come to a group and you say, you know, I'll just share another personal anecdote. My mother-in-law is a white woman. My, my husband is biracial. My, I had no idea that he was biracial because I just didn't imagine him to be. So when I met his mother, I was like, oh, okay, this is different. And we were, this was many years ago before we were married. And my mother-in-law is one of the most, most vocal and staunchest supporters of equality and racial justice I've ever met in my life. To the degree that I'm like, oh Lord, please don't get this lady started. She does not brook with any, even any inkling that someone is being discriminatory. And she doesn't see us in the way. Now, I've always been a person that when someone says, oh, I don't see color. I'm like, okay, well, that's very, you know, hard to believe because my color is part and parcel of who I am. But I was shopping with my mother-in-law and we were at Saks and I was in the dressing room and my mother-in-law walked into the dressing room and she spoke to the attendant and she said, did you see my daughter? She's a tall, beautiful woman. Mind you, I'm in a dressing room so I can hear her speaking. Before I can say I'm in here, mom, the lady goes, no, she's not in here. And so I go, mom, I'm back here. Now, I don't blame the attendant. Why would she think this blonde haired German woman is this six foot tall black woman's mother? But that's how my mother-in-law's mind works. If we get to a place where family is not predicated on who looks like us, where people are not divided by ethnic or socioeconomic boundaries, but connection points, then we're going to live in a better society, a better community, a better family, just better relationships across the board. So it's not something that's undoable. I see it done all the time. My own family looks like the United Nations. It can happen, but you've got to get out of that. Well, I'm this and you're that. I'm rich and you're poor. I'm black and you're white. I'm a woman, you're a man. We need to get to the place where we see ourselves in everyone. When you see yourself in everyone, then no one can be mistreated and you walk beyond it and not feel anything. Because at that point, you understand injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. If that can happen to them, it can happen to me. So we've got to make this an even playing field where we all come to the situation as equals, true equals, not pet projects, not something I do on my off time, not something I pick up when I want to feel good about myself, but all the time, every day. Wow. I hope that answers what you were kind of speaking to, but. Of course, I turned to Nikki's talking off, but she can chat if any comments. Um, okay. That was great. Thank you for saying, saying that. It's really wonderful listening to you. And um, Kay, I'm going to give you a chance to talk your, um, hold on, I have to unmute you. Why does my unmute button not work, Brittany? <laughs> Can you unmute Kay Aurora? There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Raina. How are you doing? Hello. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm just a little curious when you say we should approach each other as humans mm -hmm. and not state like, well, I'm coming from this position as an ally or as a white woman. I just want mm -hmm. some clarity on that because um, do you think that that then erases how we got here? Um, it sounds a little I don't bit- I think so. If yeah. you walked into a room full of white women, would you say, hi, I'm a white woman and I'd like to help you? Um, well, yeah, uh, the thing is, 
when we come together from different mm -hmm. backgrounds, right. but we don't acknowledge our histories and we approach each other as human, which, which mm -hmm. is what you're saying, then um, I just think there's an erasure of some history there by saying, oh, we're just all human, right? And so I, I, okay, I, I see don't what know you're how we move forward unless we acknowledge how we acknowledge got the wrongs of the past or just how I, we I got think, here, where we I, are I in the current moment. Okay. I, I think, I think that's just, I think in any environment, the things that we, we are afraid to speak about become monsters, you know, it becomes the, the elephant in the room. So if we just start any, any work that we're going to do by saying, it's just like we did with, with this. I said, I invite you to be safe and to, even if what you've got to say is dark, even if you feel indicted and, you know, I don't like that, you know, black women are, are lumping me in with X or whatever it is that, that, that one thing that makes you feel like I'd love to be a part of that, but I'd, I'd love to help, but whatever those buts are, those are the things you need to lead with, Whether, whatever it is. You know, like I said, I, I've, I've got a wide range of different people that I work with. And um, I, I know, so, okay, I, I have an older client. Um, she's from Croatia. And she initially was a phone client. She was a referral. And so she didn't see me when we started to introduce ourselves and create the space for her to have an appointment when we were doing our consult. And we had a great rapport. But when she came in, uh, she gave me the what I call the five second pause because my name is Raina Munson. The way I write and in some instances, the way I speak don't always connotate the way I present. So she was taken aback. And I could see the wheels turning in her mind because she was so enthusiastic about her appointment until she met me in person. And she was trying to figure out how can I extricate myself from this commitment without, you know, engendering any kind of malice. And I give people the room to be themselves. I want you to be comfortable. And who you work with in any capacity, whether it's a physician, a therapist, a, a Reiki practitioner, a life coach, needs to be someone you have an energetic connection with and a wonderful rapport with because that's how trust is built. So I just put it on the table and I just said, I don't look like you thought I would, do I? And she kind of was, you know, she got surprised and she was like, no, no, it's not that. And I said, it's fine. I want you to move beyond what's troubling you. It's more important to me that you find the right person than that that person be me. And I think when I said that, something inside of her responded and she went through with the appointment. And she's been a client of mine for a year now and we have a fantastic relationship. But I don't think that this older woman from Croatia, other than that, would have ever made that connection to me. So I said all that to say that Sometimes you think the barrier or the thing that's going to prevent you from becoming part of the whole is that you're a white woman or that you're privileged or that whatever, you're rich or they're poor, whatever it is. But the barrier is just that you haven't walked into the room. Walk into the room. Take the temperature. And if it feels uncomfortable, there might be reasons for that. And it's time to acknowledge them. It's okay to say, yeah, I'm here because I want to be of service. It feels a bit uncomfortable. I know that we don't know each other, but I'm willing to do the work to get to a place where you and I can trust one another. And I think that's very disarming. Uh, one of the techniques that I did when I was uh, many years ago, when I was in a supervisory position, when I was dealing with any kind of um, animus or people having disagreement or, you know, trouble in, in the workplace, what do you want? When someone is angry and ginned up and stirred up and spewing venom and you say, what do you want? It takes the air out of them because they don't know what they, they know what they don't want, but not everyone knows what they want. So the first thing we all have to do is identify, what do I want? Do I want, I want to be of service. I want to be a part of 
a catalyst for change. I want to be on the right side of history. I want to be a sister. I want to be included in that sisterhood. I've, I've had that conversation. Again, I have a lot of different friends. I had a very good friend of mine tell me, I don't feel like, and this is a personal conversation, but I'm sure I have her permission to share. I don't feel like white women have the same kind of sisterhood that black women do. What? That's an odd thing to say. I'm like, you've got, you've got three sisters. And she's like, I don't mean our actual sisters. I mean, I see black women and they can be in a space and they just seem to have this unspoken bond, this innate connection that I don't feel in a room full of white women, whether I know them or not. She's like, we walked into, so we were walking into a conference. She's like, we walked into the conference and they greeted you. No one greeted me. And I'm like, let me, let me tell you what that is and what that looks like and what that actually derives from. Shared experience, shared trauma, acknowledgement. I see you. We're not, there's not a lot of us here. So we, black people have what we call the universal head nod because we're only 13 to 15% of the populace. So there's a lot of chances for us to be the only in a lot of different environments. So when you walk into a space, we're taught to acknowledge one another, to seek each other out, to make connection, to be part of the greater family. So we do have that innate bond, but it's not because we're black. It's because we acknowledge one another. I do the same thing. I have great friends. I have what I call my tribe, my sisters, and they come in every shape and size, every color, every age. And I think it just takes an openness. I'm a very open person. If I say you're my friend, I love you, I mean it. I, if I invite you into my home with my crazy, rowdy family, you're part of the family. And anyone that walks into that door is going to treat you as such. And that's how we all need to be. And when we create those types of environments and bonds and, and affinity for one another, that's not based in suspicion or hostility or, or some type of how can I use this person for comeuppance. It's just, I want to share your energy. I want to exude and exist in the space of your heart and, and, and share my love and receive yours. When you open yourself, it, it's like you're a magnet. But when you live in a fear space, when you are residing in your lower energy centers, in your fight or flight response, in your reptilian brain, when you don't access your higher self, when you don't lead with love, things can feel intimidating. You can feel shut out, isolated, not welcome. I don't feel unwelcome anywhere. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, <laughs> but that's how I feel. When I walk into a space, unless someone says, hey, get out of here, I feel welcome. But that's not because I naturally am. It's just because I don't feel like I'm not. And when you don't feel unwelcome, guess what? People are welcoming. You have to create that which you want to receive. If you are open, people will be open to you. If you lead with love, people will love you back. If you show empathy, people will empathize with you. And then you won't have that feeling of othering or having to shoulder burdens that you didn't create. Because you, you are not the reason for the animus. You're just the receptacle for it. But I don't accept that. What's mine is mine's and what's theirs is theirs. So if that's not something that I did, I'm not gonna receive it and that's okay. And I think people go, oh, well, geez, okay, fine. Because there, there's really nothing natural about the monikers we give. These are all constructs. Race and ethnicity and all of these things are just things we've made up. We're all human, period. Everything else is a, con a construct of man. So if you remove those things and move back into your naturalistic, your naturalistic and your, your innate instinctual self, then these things kind of fall away. Nice. Um, thank you. That's a really, really powerful stuff. And um, I have another question. 
from sure. Caitlin Yakimovich. And I'm going to allow to talk. And then, Brittany, I think you have to do the unmuting. I think I'm here. Yes. Hi, We're good. Hi, um, I just want to so sincerely thank you for your message of healing and of love and of empowerment. I think I was feeling a lot like Nikki coming into this evening and I was feeling pretty broken. Um, mm. You know, we started Women's Week four years ago with the hope that we would be celebrating all women just in exactly the way that you're speaking tonight. And I mm. haven't heard it articulated quite as beautifully as you have this evening. So it's been very cathartic to listen oh. to you and kind of, I think, bring Women's Week full circle back to where we started. Um, sorry, I'm getting sort of emotional about it. But no, um, it's, you know what? That's let it come. We're, <laughs> we're so programmed not to feel our feelings. And as an empath and an intuitive, you, you emoting is exactly what I need to know that I'm saying and doing the right things. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. And um, in the spirit of of supporting each other and supporting you as a businesswoman, I mm -hmm. number one selfishly want to know how I can get more of you in my life, and okay. number two give you an opportunity and a platform to to tell us a little bit more about your business and okay. the services that you do offer, so that um, for those of us that are looking to have a little bit more of this healing on a regular basis, we don't have to wait for another year to come together and have these conversations. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I, I will put in the chat where I'm located. Again, I own a business downtown Morgan Hill in California here. I'm right on 2nd Street across from Big Chair Park. Um, the things that I do here are very um, energy centric, very holistic, but also some traditional. So I'm a life coach and I use both traditional coaching modalities and energetic um, uh, ideology as a mix as it comes. Some of my clients are very linear. They don't want the, you know, the airy fairy. They just want the straight across and that's great. Um, I do Reiki. I'm a master level Reiki practitioner and I'm also a certified clinical hypnotherapist. Um, those are for me, the things that I, I love Reiki. Reiki is something, I, I grew up in a very um, traditional African-American Southern Baptist family. I never was introduced to any energetic modalities or spiritual practices outside of Jesus. <laughs> That's all you need is Jesus. <laughs> so, and I still need Jesus, I love God. And so for me, I seven years ago began this kind of um, exploration of what else I could do. You know, what am I going to be when I grow up? Because my children are, were older and my husband was well established in his career and it was kind of like, what is my next step? And so that's when I began my training as a life coach. That's when I began my training in Reiki. And um, I, love, I love to do it. Um, I also lead guided meditations. Um, we have a lot of workshops here. I, again, I am all about female empowerment. I'm a girl's girl. I love anything goddess powered, anything in the divine feminine. So we do women's womb health and sensuality workshops here. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a very in-depth intimacy course. Um, it is going to be an eight-part series. It'll have an introductory class that's really, really about reconnecting with self, reconnecting with our physicality, our spirituality, our sensuality, and our love center and our pleasure centers. And then as that course is the introductory course is over, there will be a series of seven additional courses that teach us how to connect with our physical, mental, and spiritual self through the seven chakras. Um, I'm very, very much, um, uh, Coming to it from, I guess I'm a big nerd, so I love the science and the magic. So I love to show people how things that are everyday, mundane, um, widely held belief systems are all centered in very beautiful and amazing spiritual practices, things that you can do to um, bring love and prosperity, abundance, happiness, joy, wealth, connection, love, all of the things we all want how we can manifest them. We are very, 
very powerful individuals. Um, if you think of your body as, an, as a robot and your brain as a supercomputer, your energetic and emotional body is the operating system. And when you are the person that is the author of your own story, instead of just being thrown hither and yon by experiences and circumstances, you can create the life you've always wanted to live. And that is literally what I'm doing right now is writing my own story with the intention to get to the happy ending. And I think a lot of times we start to experience life as a set and a system of tasks. I wake up, I go to work, I take care of my children, I clean my house, I wash my dishes, I clean my, I start to do things, Monday I gotta do this, Tuesday I gotta do this. And we're not actually experiencing things. We're giving ourselves a very limited purview into the real connected and spiritual and beautiful um, part of existence. And that's the most, the tiniest things, the sun on your face, you know, a baby's breath, the touch of your lover, these are the things that should be the height of our day, not the things that I'm like, oh, I got to get to sleep. So are you going to be done soon? You know what I mean? <laughs> so you, you really want to you really get back connected to your physical body. And you would be stunned at how many people I do my first session. My first question is always, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, I'll wait. Yeah, you know, my husband is dealing with, you know, job loss and my mother's in hospice and I've got a child that's got, you know, some issues, maybe some opioid. Ad that, that's a lot. Maybe you're not fine and it's okay not to be fine, but we're so programmed to not feel our feelings to the degree that as soon as you say, I don't feel so good, I've been kind of down, they want to give you a pill. Oh, let's turn your brain receptors off so you don't feel that feeling. And I want us to get back to the place that says it's okay to wake up and not be at the top of the at the top of the mountain. It's okay to feel our feelings. It's okay to be disillusioned. It's okay to be angry, frightened, sad. That's okay because if you have those emotions, then you know what joy, euphoria, love, uh, you know, all of these kinetic and uh, energetic and beautiful feelings are as well. You can't have light without dark. And we've got to learn how to integrate the shadow self. And that again is going to be part of the course. So we do a lot here. Unfortunately with COVID, we've had to kind of slow down on our, our larger um, events, but we do paint and sip because I love a good glass of wine or bottle. <laughs> Um, I love to have fun, you know, I want us to have, and I hear a lot, and this is a thing for me as well. I moved here 10 years ago. Um, my children at the time were in elementary school. So I was, you know, mom taxi and soccer mom and tiger mom and getting them through school. But my children are in college now. Um, and I, I'm like, I don't have a life. I need to get a life. I used to be very social. I had a huge circle of friends, but somehow, some way, I turned into the boring housewife. And I don't want to be that. So I started to have these events. And I met all of these fantastic, beautiful women that come in and they create malas with us. And they um they do all of these fantastic um, healing events with us. Um, my sister is also a Reiki master. She's actually a Reiki master teacher. And so she comes from Colorado. We do drumming circles. We, do, we just do, we have fun. We need to get back to having fun. We need to learn how to have fun. Lighten up because the world is heavy. It is heavy. And if you're so mired in the immense just, you know, multitude of sins that are all converging at once. It's so dark. It's so burdensome. And it's so, it feels lonely and isolating. And I don't want us to feel alone. I want us to feel connected. I want us to feel euphoric and joyful and loved and loving and all of those amazing things that we feel great. You feel great. You look great. You, you know, you look better. You sound better. You get better sleep when you have these feelings. So, Again, my practice is all about healing, healing past trauma, healing, healing current condition, healing future, because you want to create a future memory. You want to visualize, you want to verbalize, you want to actualize the life that you want to live. So, um, 
yeah, I definitely invite all of you to come and visit me. I'll put um, some information about my location and uh, where we are. And uh, um, I don't know how many of you are local to Morgan Hill, um, but if you are in the local area, I'm open Tuesday through Saturday. I love people to just drop in and say, hey, you know, just see what we do here. Looking's free. It's, it's a super low, <laughs> low pressure. I'm the world's worst business person because I'm kind of like, it sells itself. <laughs> if, if they need it, they'll come get it. And okay. that's been true. So, and then let me see my telephone number and my email. And I think it's also hopefully on the, um, on the, I don't know if it was on the invite, but anyway, uh, if it's not, you should be able to get me at any of these different uh, things. And uh, Brittany has great access to me. I love Brittany. They take great care of me at the chamber. They're always kind of hand-holding me and kicking me in the butt like, hey, <laughs> get, get over here and help and, and, and meet some people because I love to be in here with my books and my rocks, as my husband calls it. And uh, it's a good vibe. It feels good in here. It's calm. It's my little oasis of calm in the crazy storm we're living in. But yeah, grab a coffee over at GVA and come down and hang out. I love to chat. I'd love to speak to anyone that's interested in trying Reiki or any energetic modality or, you know, hypnotherapy. And again, I think a lot of people hear hypnotherapy and the first thing they think of is the Vegas sideshow with people <laughs> barking and, <laughs> and clucking like chickens. It's not that. Hypnotherapy is a fantastic modality for mindfulness and deep relaxation. You're always completely awake, completely in control. You're lucid. You're just in a very deep, restive space of relaxation and once you get into what we call a trance state you go on trance state a lot if you're watching tv and then netflix is like are you still watching five hours later you're in a trance state if you're driving down the freeway and the next thing you know you're pulling in your driveway you were in a trance state so we go into trance state when you're snacking <laughs> and you look down and you go did i eat that whole box oh, of cookies? That's called. <laughs> you were in a trance state um, so we can we go into trance a lot, but this is a more productive way to, to utilize that. Great. So I think we have one, one last question um, okay. from Alicia. I don't know if she still has a question because her hand went back down, but I'm going to give her an opportunity to see if she wants Okay. To. So, Malisha, you still want to say something? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Malisha. Hi. Um, I, I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to um, thank you for, for everything that you've said, everything about healing about how we really haven't taken the time to sit down and understand each other, you know, after everything that happened with slavery and reconstruction, the, the, mm -hmm. that process never happened. And we're seeing the, the, the effects of that today, you know, right. And, um, I have this conversation with my husband all the time, but it's, it's rare to find somebody uh, who actually understand sort of that whole that whole thing um so i just wanted to say thank you i'm in the comments going yes 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 everything you're saying yes um, i love so that and and i i appreciate you you actually calling it out you know sometimes it's scary um to come into a forum like this because i i'm very clear that probably the audience is going to be a lot of people that don't look like me and may not have the same experiences as i do but i think that we're more alike than we are Dis, you know, dissimilar. So I think that when you kind of verbalize some things and someone can go, oh, I understand, or, or you say or do something and they go, oh, I felt that way as well. It creates a bond. It creates a, a, a connection point. And the more we speak and the more we engage and the more we are in each other's presence, I think the more connected and interwoven and intertwined our lives become. And when you know someone and you've got a friend and you've got a coworker and you've got all of these people that have this shared experience, it's very difficult to continue to kind of pretend it's not happening. I think that for me, I've got a lot of friends that are like, I never even realized how much stuff was going on until I started to think my son is Max until I started to think about what if that was Max? Yeah. And I think that is an extremely powerful, powerful realization is that we are so divided and so disconnected and so insular 
that we don't see one another. We don't feel one another. Yes. And we don't, you know, we don't even touch one another. I'm a, I'm a big hugger. I'm very tactile. I, I'm all about kinetic energy. I believe that you've got to have interaction. And I see that the technological advancement continuously creates more and more division physically. When you can work from home and have your food delivered and have all of your supplies, Amazon next day, and then you go, I haven't been outside in five days. I haven't been outside in two weeks. Something, there's something very unnatural about that. We have to have human contact. We have to have connection. That is what feeds our higher self. If you don't want to dwell in your lower third when you're only operating on, you know, your, your very lowest levels, if you want to elevate into, you know, your higher consciousness, those big questions, what's the meaning of life? What's my purpose here? You've got to be in touch. And these things are not euphemism for no reason. All of the things we think, I see you, I feel you. The way we speak and the way that we relate are very kinetic because I believe that human touch and human connection is the most powerful um, energy on the planet. I really do. I really, really do. I've seen the power of, of concerted prayer. I've seen the power of focused intention. I've seen the power of solid, literal linking of arms and forming a phalanx of solidarity. I've seen how powerful it is, what a powerful image it is, how it touches you, what it looks like, what it feels like when I've been in a human chain. And when I tell you the strength, the, the energy that runs through your body when you're in common cause, with this many people who are willing to take it to the limit wherever it goes, because they're that convicted. They're that connected. It's amazing. And if you're living a life where you're not touching or feeling those things deep in your core, that's no life at all. So I really want us to get back to a place where we are having a full human experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I thank you all so much for allowing me to come and speak with you. It's been fantastic. It's been very healing for me. Like I said, I was very low energy. I, I've had very little sleep these last three days. It's been very tough. You know, I did about a 45 minute um, uh, meditation earlier today with some other activists that are exhausted because they're on the ground. It's tough. So just even the, the, the fact of reaching out, you know, sometimes when we're out protesting, people will come by and just drop a case of water. If that's all you can do, it means the world. It means so much. It doesn't take a Herculean effort. It doesn't take some huge, momentous, you know, uh, life-changing event. The small things the small connections are what make the difference. So I thank you all very much for having me here. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. We appreciate your time and your words and your wisdom and your just your, your general welcoming presence, which Aww. I know many of us will be coming to check out your, your store with our masks on, of course. Awesome. <laughs> with your mask. Yeah. Just, just for that, now. Yeah. That is. Just for now, until we can one day. Just for now, until we can masked. party. Yeah. Man, I'm going to yeah. have the biggest party when this thing is under control. <laughs> I can't no. wait. They're going to be like, enough. <laughs> no, no party too big. So, and Man. thanks also to, um, to Brittany and the Chamber of Commerce and all of the wonderful proponents of Women's Week for letting Search South County, which is uh, what I represent tonight. We are a group of local um, activists organizing for racial justice. And I did put in the comments. If you want to check us out, we have monthly meetings online the third Sunday of every month. And we do all kinds of things um, to also try to keep making things better in the world. Thank you so much, Jordan. I so appreciate everything that you're doing. I appreciate your commitment and your bravery. Thank you so much, Brittany, for just being so dynamic and being such a, just a resource and a font of amazing information and advice and you know championship when i'm stressed out like what am i gonna do so you women 
I love women. I love women. And I just, I want us to get back to the place where we recognize how powerful we are because women shape the world. Women shape the world we live in. Yeah. Men may be the head, but we're the neck. <laughs> so we've got to, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to keep turning. We've got to keep turning this thing. And I think we're, we're just, I think we're just now starting to get on the, the, the yeah, precipice, yeah. just reaching yeah. the peak of our power. And I'm so excited for everything that's coming forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Any words, Brittany, or are we? No, um, Rain is right. fabulous. Everybody knows it now. Okay. <laughs> have a great night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank Thanks you so all much. so much. You guys have a blessed and wonderful evening. You too. Thank you.